Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Francesco. Welcome to another episode of Appliance Advisors. How are you this week, Dennis? Doing great, Fran. I won't lie to you. I'm going to be doing a lot better when the Celtics win tonight. Golden okay. State's going down. I feel it. I feel strong about it. It's going to Big come night here in Boston. No okay. question about it. We need this one. Push it to a game seven. Let's, uh, we can, I think we got this. All right. All right. You wearing the jersey, by the way, on the couch? What do you, what do you, what's that look like? Play the notes for me. At it's home, you're watching the game. You got a, you got a game jersey. What do you got? I already have it on underneath. I just rip. I, I just go home. I'm like Hulk Hogan style. Rip this off, and I'm ready for the game. Love it. All right, that's the energy we need tonight. We need to right. on. Right. Anyways, I so, guess we should talk some appliance stuff here. All right, so switching to appliances. So this week we're going to switch the show up a little bit for you guys. So we have a. Um, we're going to do it a little bit differently this week. And, you know, one of the things as we've been going and, you know, we've been answering a lot of questions and we've had tons of great uh, feedback from the audience members, too. And one of the things that people have asked a lot is to really kind of dive deep in some of these more common categories and really a lot of these different categories. So today we're going to start and we're really going to dive deep in the pro ranges. And there's a lot there. So we want to talk about everything pro ranges with you. You know, what is a pro range? Talk about configurations, some of the brands, um, service questions that you should be asking the people where you're buying the range. So we want to really dive deep and give you a full understanding of what it means to purchase a pro range, maybe some, again, service, things like that. So we're really going to talk about that. So, and for, for the audience, if you, if you have any questions specific to pro ranges, we're going to have a, a live Q and a session at the end here that we're going to try to answer as many questions as possible. If you have other questions that are really kind of, you know, non pro range specific, we will definitely do our best to try to get to those also. But if we don't, we will save those and definitely answer those in a future episode for you. So we're going to start right now. And really kind of the basic question here is what is a pro range? Yeah, it's a good question. You talked a lot about them, but I don't know if anyone knows what they are. Of course, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people do. But So a pro range by definition is, is well, or industry standard is really, was built by the brand Viking years and years and years ago in the residential side of business. And it was more a restaurant style range that could be cooked in in the home and really was defined by what was the industry standard at the time was a 15,000 BTU in a burner, a British thermal, thermal units. Um, just that's that's the power of the burner. And to just give people perspective, you know, if you had a, a classic GE range from years and years ago growing up, or even, even one that's on the market today, that's not a pro range. The industry standard for a long time was probably an 8,000 B2 burner or 7,000 B2 burner on a normal non-pro range. Then you had Viking come out with these, these burners that were 15,000 B2s. And the big differentiator at the time was that every single burner was 15,000. So they could go really high and they could still go really low. So they kind of gave you that full flexibility, fast boiling, and we're impatient. We want things, yes, really quickly. Um, so that was the benefit to it. That was really what started this craze of, of pro ranges. All right, very good. And so, and you know, another kind of really basic question too is, you know, we, we talk about pro ranges and standard freestanding front control ranges. You know, we talk about that all the time. But what are some of the kind of the basic differences between what you get with a pro range and a more standard range? Yeah. So the industry standard range size, let's start size first, is 30 inches. That's four burners. That's what most people have. Now, truth be told, there are some smaller ranges really apartment style or really if you have really small space maybe in the city that can go down to 24 or even 20 inch ranges but 30 inches is is 95 percent of the market and that was a four burner range when you get the pro ranges you can start getting bigger so they start at 30 they go mm -hmm. 36 48 60. um so that's kind of what happens and as they go bigger you get more burners and sometimes you get more ovens so as an example, in a 30 inch range, you'd get four burners and in a, in, a, in a 36 inch range, you could get up to six burners or four burners and a choice of a grill or a griddle in place of the burners. And your oven now is bigger, it's wider, it's 36 inches wide. Then you can go up to 48 inches. And this is kind of mm -hmm. kind of dive right into that next question. Yeah. Point, but 48 inches, 
gave you heck and there are a few brands that give you eight eight burners or six burners and a grill or a griddle mm -hmm. or four burners and a grill and a griddle so you started to really be able to play with the range and then when you get up to 60 you get you get two ovens and they're equal size oven so really think about it like this when you get to 60 inches divide it in half and you really have two 30 inch ovens yeah. in one big rig right? so, yeah, so you're really getting two kind of yeah 30 you get you get one range i mean one oven 36 you get one oven it's just wider and you get six more mm -hmm. you go to 48 now you get in you get a, a an oven and you get a smaller companion oven yeah it's much smaller and then when you go to 60 you get two 30 inch rings uh, two 30-inch uh, oven cavities really built into the range. So th those are the differences. All right, very good. And then um, really, you know, we talk a lot of the questions that we get too, and and really I think where customers have some of the decision to make, one is the size, it's the configuration. And we always get that question, like, you know, is it worth upgrading to a 48-inch? So you have a lot of customers. That, you know, one, what is the most common size in your Yeah, product? so, I mean, that, that you know, it's a big topic. So really, mm -hmm. we tell people, um, you know, when, when if they if they want a pro range, they need to really think about do they need it? Do they need and really stop and step back before you get into a showroom and see a lot of pretty things, right? It's like going to a car dealership and looking at amazing cars. Do you need all that? Maybe you do. No, maybe you don't. Do. I think it starts with the needs checklist and kind of really functionally and how you cook and entertain. What does that look like? Um, I think that's the most important starting point for people, but you know, absolutely, these these ranges really will start at the top down. Things to think about as you get over a thirty inch range is: Do you want a grill or a griddle? You know, um, they can be built in. Uh, my recommendation is always going to be a griddle. It will never be a grill, because when you and I say that because when you buy a pro range automatically, even if it's a thirty inch range, understand we talked about the power of those burners. And we talked about the industry standard way back when being 15,000 BTUs of power. Know that some of them go up to 25,000 BTUs of power. Now. So they are getting more and more power. Whether or not you need that, again, is your question. You know, you're going to boil very quickly on all of them. Um, but beyond that, it's a hood, right? So, so if you're putting up all that heat, it's got to get taken out of the house. So mm -hmm. you're, you have these hood requirements and the idea that you have to penetrate and push the smoke outside of your home. So you want to make sure you can do those things right off the get-go. Beyond that, now thinking about that grill, the grill puts off that much more smoke and grease and heat. So I'm not a big proponent of it. It's a cool idea. I find 99% of customers tell us they loved it. They wish they never did it because they don't use it because the cleanup and the heat and the smoke and the fire alarms and everything else, it's just awful to deal with. Um, and and I still tell people you pay roughly $1,000 more to opt for a grill uh, built into one of these pro ranges. That could buy a really nice Weber grill and put it outside on your neck, yeah. and and then you can shut the lid and be done, and the cleanup's kind of over. Um, as well, so I'd really always lean people to a griddle if that were the decision, because the griddle, if you if you really were torn between the two, the griddle's probably a little more universal, certainly easier to cook. Um, you know, and then and then people ask us what's the most popular size. Um, you know, you you can absolutely get colors. There's plenty of colors you can get. Some of these bigger ranges have warming drawers built right into them. So what does that look like? Um, certain brands have they have a one a one uh, thirty inch range on the right hand side, and on the left hand side could be everything from a uh, microwave draw to a steam oven, and then a warm up warming draw below that. So a range, steamer, and a warming draw all built into this bigger range. Now when you do that, you're talking a forty eight inch range or or bigger. You're into a bigger style range. Again, I always tell people when you really get to a bigger range and you get into the 48 back up, our most popular are 30 and 36 inch. That is the industry most popular. And why? Because, well, just natural. A lot of people can't fit a four foot stove mm -hmm. or, a, or a 60 inch or five foot stove because they want some cabinets in the kitchen too, right? And it, it's eating up counters and cabinets at that point. And it may be way more cooking product than you need. I also tell people when my recommendation would be um, either a 30 or 36, particularly it comes down to people a lot of times saying 36 or 48. That's a popular decision for people. And really the decision there is um, people say, oh, well, I like the second oven in a 48 inch pro range. 
but you really need to think about that because that second oven um, is really, really small in a 48 inch range. I mean, so small that most people don't use it. it it's yeah. tiny. You're talking small, very narrow products. And you paid an awful lot for that 48 inch range. So for that amount of money, you could really get a 36 inch range. So six burners in a single oven and still buy a second wall oven and put it somewhere else in the kitchen and now think about it. You have two full-size ovens, one's up tall in your kitchen, one's down low. Uh, you know, you really broke up the functionality and probably spent similar money to go into a 48-inch range. So we really caution people that. And I think that, and listen, it's yes, this is self-serving, but it's really the difference between shopping at a, an appliance store that takes this type of advisement very seriously because you're spending a lot of money. And we want to make sure that you spend it. So at the end of the day, you probably walk away and say, hmm, they gave me some things to think about that no one is talking about. Maybe my kitchen designer didn't bring it up. Maybe they didn't know enough to or we didn't get that far. Or, or maybe this other appliance store didn't bring that up. And and, and it's it's actually either saving us money or really, wow, this is opening up a whole other opportunity. You should just have be armed with that knowledge when you're when you're spending that kind of money in the range. So 36 inch range, I think, is the sweet spot for everybody. I recommend six burners. Not that you need six every day, but when you do entertain, you sometimes need a fifth burner or you need the space to drag your pots and pans over to. And I think in those times, you really regret not having that extra burner. You really do. Yeah. And like you said, you know, for the, especially for the top, you know, most people, you know, you know six burners six is plenty sufficient. And like I said, most times you don't even use that many. And then when you get to that 48 inch, you have all this open space, it takes up counter space. Or something you may or may never use really all yeah. those burners in so, there. so that yeah so we know 30 and 36 30 is straightforward it's four mm -hmm. burners we're just picking the right options for you 36 you have now your next step of six burners or do i do four burners in a grill or a griddle mm -hmm. okay um now someone's going to catch me here yes there's brands out there like signature kitchen suites that actually have a sous vide burner in the middle there's a couple of brands that have an induction burner built in the middle absolutely but 90% of it comes back to today, a grill or a griddle is an option. And we still always would recommend six burners because again, to buy that grill or griddle, you're spending close to a thousand dollars more for that. And I really think there's times when you're going to need five or six burners and that extra thousand dollars could buy you a really nice countertop griddle or a really nice Calphalon or all clad mm -hmm. accessory griddle to put on those six on the two burners going across and really replicate close to the griddle that's built in, but you still have full flexibility and probably saved a bunch of money. So All right. Great I could go on for days of, of about that, but you know, hopefully that gives people just an overarching. You know, yeah. Kind of yeah. That's great. And just one other point too, to just go back kind of what you made when you talked about ventilation really on those grills and things like that, you know, that is also another really good differentiator between kind of a standard range and a pro yeah. range. You know, with pro ranges, you absolutely need, whether it's a 30 or 36, all burners, you definitely need more power, powerful ventilation and you need to be able to vent that out. Whereas, you know, a, a standard freestanding range, not to say that performance wise, it's great, but you could do an over the range microwave or recirculating hood. Again, performance, obviously we know isn't going to be as good, but with the pro ranges, it's an absolute must. And then in Massachusetts specifically, you know, then you really get to make up there and things like that too. Yeah. There's other, you know, I, I tell people again, because people don't do this every day. Some people have done it many times and they know it as well as we do, you know, but there's other people, when we say vent to hood outside, you need to really, that's an explore. We're going to ask you a lot of questions when you, when you say you can do that. Um, because a lot of people say, oh, well, I have a hood currently in events outside. It's a regular stove and I'm doing this kitchen over. I, you know, I think I could probably vent it. Up. Understand when you get into a pro range, you're talking a very large guy much bigger than a microwave duct or an inexpensive hood duct it's big and it's not so much can it happen you got to think about how are they going to get the duct out of the house if it's a new construction we want to plan for it and talk about it at the concept before they frame so that the contractor or the framers can actually allow for the space for the duct to run through the house if it's an existing home we need really that information to understand how do we vent it outside how far is the duct running can you fit the duct through the existing uh joists and and, and framing in the house um so there's some considerations not to scare you we, we help you walk you through it 
but this is part of the process to make sure you're a good candidate ultimately for a pro range aside from being able to maybe afford it or design it in functionally once you do all that will it work for you absolutely so then the next kind of consideration and you go through the sizes the the, the cooktop configuration all those things now the next decision a customer needs to make is really you know is the fuel type do i do all gas do i do dual fuel what does that mean first off and what are the benefits of each and is one better than the other or how, how should people look at that yeah i mean so fuel types really you know it's pretty straightforward you have all gas which and what that means is gas oven and a gas top um and in, when we talk about gas, you have two types of fuel. So you can do natural gas, or some people have a tank uh, where they run liquid propane gas. Okay, so two types of gas. Um, again, that's just a question at the time of ordering and, and that type. Um, and then you have the concept of what's called dual fuel, which means um, it's, it's a gas top with an electric oven. Um, it's another really popular option. You absolutely sell more gas on gas stoves. So all gas stoves definitely dominate dual fuel, but dual fuel is still a very big part, you know, it's probably still more than a third of, of what you sell. And, and why you, uh, when you buy a dual fuel stove, 99% of the times understand it's going to come with every feature that we can put on a stove. So every bell and whistle goes with it. Right. And then beyond that, the electric oven, the benefit of that dual fuel would be that an electric heat is generally universally more even and consistent. Mm -hmm. And it does everything, all types of cooking pretty well. It bakes very well because it's accurate to the more closely to the degree. Mm -hmm. So in a recipe, it's going to be more even um, and it's going to be it's a more dry heat. So if you want things to rise and whatnot, that dry, lighter heat allows for something to rise and consistency in a recipe and baking is important. If you're a big roaster, um, you know, the gas oven is a moist, a more moist heat. Uh, if you broil a lot, gas broiling is certainly uh, advantageous over electric. Um, so, you know, those are questions, again, we're going to ask you. If you were to that person that stuck with that dual fuel and said, hey, listen, I kind of want to, I want that universal cooking and I want kind of every feature the stove has to offer. The only hidden thing, again, we we talked to you about is it requires more power now, right? Because the oven itself is truly electric. So you're talking 220 power and you want to make sure that you have that run behind the stove and that your your panel can account for that, your your actual electrical panel. Yeah. Um, whereas all gas stoves really require a glorified toaster plug. I mean, it's 110 power, um, you know, so those those are kind of the differences. When you do all gas, not in all brands, but in some brands, you then have choices. So we said dual fuel is kind of going to give everything to you. You're going to get every feature and self-cleaning is a standard feature when you do dual fuel when you do all gas you can vary depending on the brand some offer a non-self-cleaning all gas range some offer a self-cleaning gas range or both types and just to really wrap that together why would someone offer a non-self-cleaning oven remember again i said viking built the business really way back when and it came out of the commercial roots and then they said, hey, there's a need for people that want this thing, this type of big industrial look in these bigger stoves in residential settings. When you go to restaurants, they don't have self-cleaning ovens. They don't exist. They self-clean large part because the oven gets so darn hot and they, they turn it up and kind of bake most of everything off and wipe it out. But they're scrubbing the inside of that oven physically um, because self-cleaning brings the uh, adds to the cost. Or I, sh I should say manufacturers then realized, wow, in the 2000s and at really after 2008 kind of coming out of that little correction well not the little correction but the correction we had um you know people had a lot of equity in their homes they were doing these great new kitchens and they were saying hey i'm going to go for it i'm going to do it this pro range i've been seeing in the pictures and the magazines i want this thing and they come in and they said well listen i've had a ge stove i've had a, a an lg whatever they've had they've had a regular stove in their house and it always had self-cleaning of course i want self-cleaning so the manufacturers got keen to that and said, okay, so you want an all gas self-cleaning stove? Well, of course I do. I've always had it. Sure, we'll do that. We'll charge you an extra thousand dollars for mm -hmm. it. And people didn't even bat an eyelash. So just know that that's how that whole evolution came. It started when when, when Pro Rangers first came out, you could add a bag full of money, a, a tractor trailer truck. And I couldn't have sold you an all gas range that either A, had self-cleaning 
or, or B had in Dutch. You know, it was just a straightforward stove. And, it, and as it's evolved, now they've added options. We, we're Americans. We like options. We like yeah, options. lots of features for sure. Uh, <laughs> so that was long winded, but that's that's kind of the business and how it came to be and fuel types and the differences and considerations. Yeah. yeah. And even like things like timers to a degree, you know, like all gas ranges, a lot of those is there's no timer. And of course, you know, certain brands, you know, in the all gas, you get the self clean and the timers and things like that. But there's a, that, that's a big, you know, someone that's, I hear that a lot too, you know, people that have never really looked at a, a, a pro range and they're shut like, what do you mean there's no timer on this thing? Like, how do, I, how do I keep the time, you know? So it's one of those things that like, again, going back to, are you a candidate for a pro range? You have to think about those features and the style sure. that you want, dual fuel, all gas. And now kind of going into the next question, and this really is more so kind of probably with the dual fuel, but the different types of controls that you get, you know, they, they have ones that have standard knobs. And now you're really starting to see, they really started with a wall oven. It's like you said, all these features that are built into wall ovens, the electronics, yeah. everything like that. Now they're really starting to put those same features in their mostly dual fuel ranges. You know, talk about like some of those differences, what you get with some of those guided yeah. control and things like that. Remember, we talked about this evolution of this category in the retail space, residential space. Standard knobs originally came out with, think about your, when you turn your, uh, like you said, most of them didn't have a clock. They were just knobs, right? Simple. They were thermostatically controlled. So just a basic thermostat controlled each knob. And you'll remember, we've all had them. When you turn your oven temperature to say 375, there isn't actually a number of 375 initially that wasn't digital. It was a dash on a knob. So you might've went from 350 to 400 and there was a dash in the middle and you're trying to, yeah. your recipe yeah. calls for 360. I don't know. You, yeah, you couldn't somewhere get in the middle there. You're like, yeah, I'm pretty close. Just know that those thermostatically controlled knobs, because we're a big servicer, was it, it was industry acceptable to be within 25 to 50 degrees of those thermostatically mm -hmm. controlled knobs. And it still is today. I mean, that, that can, it can be that far off. So realizing that again, customers would spend the money for the accuracy and they kind of, they wanted everything it had to offer, but they also wanted the comforts of the things they always had, which were things like timers. They wanted digital accuracy. So now you started to see clocks. You started to see brands like Wolf and other brands start on the knob many times, turn and have a digital number or a digital degree. Well, we like that because now electronically controlled, a lot more accurate to the degree. So cooking got a lot more precise and that was the next evolution. And now finally, fast forward, now you're seeing a lot of these pro ranges with actual uh, TFT, like actual just screens built into them. Some pop out, some are built right in. That actually is, leads into that guided cooking portion. Yeah. And what does that mean? I mean, they can be as fancy as, good Lord, you know, you don't know how to cook and you want to cook a prime rib and maybe you only do that twice a year and you forget your recipe card. I mean, this thing literally will tell you, select your pan. It will show you the pan. Yeah. A color image of what pan you're looking for in your kitchen. Yeah. Show you, you put your rack down. Show you how to tie the meat. I mean, it can go that granular. Yeah, tells you the temperature, temperature bro. Yeah. Tells you the temperature to put it on. In fact, you can just pick roast. I mean, there's certain brands out there. Meal Master Chef, Jenier has some. I mean, a lot of them that, um, that yeah, the literally. New fuels, yeah. yeah, Fisher Paykel and some of the new stuff. You literally can put it in. Uh, actually, SKS. I mean, it's really becoming yeah. a standard where you can literally punch in the meat that you're cooking and it predetermines the temperature. Heck, mm -hmm. it will start it off and roast it and sear it and then bring it down to a lower temperature. And the temperature probe that's integrated into the stove or in a blue, some have Bluetooth actually, but that integrated into the stove itself are now giving you on your phone, that's my phone, sorry, giving you actual <laughs> feedback so you can see how much time you have left. It's actually yeah. giving you a countdown clock. I mean, imagine that. Think about that. Yeah, We've all been at that. If you've been at my house, you've definitely been on, at a holiday. You've definitely had that turkey or that roast, and you're like, "Man, that pop-up timer happened way too quick." Or we got to cut into this baby. You know, yeah. now you're cutting into it. Is it pink in the middle? Is it red? Is it cooked? Oh my gosh, is it raw? I mean, so now, or you waited and you overcooked it, and then you didn't time anything. And in my house, always what happened was two things: someone either was so harried and crazy, and this was me. This is my wife's actually really good cook. I either burned the rolls because I left them in too long, so I was messing around with this darn roast, or I forgot to put them in, and I'm a carb guy, so yeah. I'm, now I'm really upset. So I may know. or may not have started a fire in the oven, one or two yeah, things. Well, you know. Know. <laughs> so think of that. Think of amazingly being able to look at your look at your either at the stove or actually on your phone when you're entertaining. Imagine you're having an appetizer, you're across the room, and you actually can look at your phone and realize, wow, I have 35 minutes left. 
you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to actually start the sides. Now I'm going to set the table. I'm going to pour the wine or pour the water. It's really can get pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty, yeah. Pretty incredible stuff too. And those are the features that typically it really, you'll see those on the dual fuel. Cause a lot of times they do require the more power and you need that 220 volt and things like that. That stuff's just not going to really operate a lot of times with everything else on a 110 on gas. So correct. All right. So the next thing is, you know, the next category we're going to talk about is kind of one of those things that, you know, this is kind of the fun stuff. People want to know the sizes, the brands, control styles, all these cool menu functionalities. And really, you know, let's talk about delivery and installation, because that is just as critical as kind of selecting the ranges. How the delivery happens, who delivers, who does the install? Yeah, I'm, and, and, you know, I'm looking at the time and, and we have five, five, we can go a little over, but we have some time, not a lot of time. So I'm going to piggyback kind of two things together in terms of installation and, and start just to talk of service. So two things I would tell you is delivery installation service. Ideally, the company you buy it from can do all three for you, right? Because it's an expensive purchase. Yep. And I'm going to tell anyone that's shopping out there, the numbers are the same everywhere, just so you know. No, you're not, you're not going to call anyone and get a better number. And, and that's to your benefit because the internet has allowed for that. And that's a good thing that the internet has brought forward is that the integrity and the number. So the manufacturers set the pricing. Um, and honestly, folks, it's the lowest pricing it's ever been in terms of markup on these products. So that's that's kind of a good thing because really you kind of don't want, it's no haggle shopping. And, and it really should be at that category because you're spending good money and you want to make sure that the decisions you make are the right ones for you and that you really stop worrying about the money best you can you know your budget but that you can start talking about benefits and features and if if they matter to you so i would tell you right there that's something to really think about um i think that's kind of really important um and then as well the delivery making sure that whoever is you're buying it from is actually using their own delivery agents and they control that portion i mean the horror stories and this isn't so google it folks you google the you google the internet company that's supposedly going to ship you something google their better business not the fake reviews that they pay a third party company to prop up their review go to better business bureaus go somewhere you're smart and educated go to yelp not that i love yelp this isn't a thing for it but the people that do that actually have to do it consistently and no one's perfect but if you're seeing one star and five stars on their own website something's wrong i mean really so do that due diligence because it's an expensive piece it's 800 pounds it comes through your house you know so delivery and install making sure that that person could own it if you have a contractor that's owning that portion of the installation and you ever bought from us and there's other great dealers out there. In fact, one of the great dealers out there is our buddies over at Dawn's Appliance who just texted me and said they love the pool in the background here. Trust me, it's a screen drop. It's not mine. We're appliance guys. Pretty simple life. Um, I, I do fine with a bucket back there with some water in it. But uh, no, they're awesome guys. You know, we talk about that. Like a dealer like Dawn's out in Pittsburgh um, area or us down here in Boston. You know, the delivery... The installation, making sure if something goes wrong, have your contractor reach out to dealers like us because we can actually take that over for them. Honestly, we can do it for less than their tradespeople would do, and it's all we do. And many times because we're certified, you're going to get an extra year warranty on your behalf, um, and it doesn't cost anyone anything. And we take a headache away, and we own the whole problem. And I only bring up Don's because they just talked, texted me, but they are similar to what they service. And, and if something were to go wrong, you know, they do it right then and there, you know? Your project is stressful enough by the time you're ready to take the appliances. Wouldn't it be best to go with somebody that if, if there is a bump in the road, they're not passing the buck to somebody else to say, well, let me call a service agent. They're just going to handle it. Cause at that point you're there, you're this close to cooking on it yeah. and enjoying that glass of wine, probably for what was a long arduous process. So yeah. make sure that's why we always it. try to educate on this because it's one of those things that like everyone gets so excited about the product, but this is the part that kind of falls through the cracks. Yeah. You know, and it's so, if, so if we can rule out the fact that the price is standard and we kind of pulled the wool over that thing, the price mm -hmm. is out, it's, it's set. So there's no, don't worry about haggle and shopping. It's not going to happen. And, and I will tell you this, anyone that does is at risk of losing whatever line they sell if they avoid the pricing. So I'd honestly, Tell you to dig deeper into better business bureaus they're probably hurting in other areas of that company yeah. and the money is that much to lose a whole line so just just do that due diligence that's our that's our soapbox pitch but it's honestly it, it's your money it, you're spending the same try to be with someone that can back it up should something go wrong 
yeah, very good for peace of mind and just long term, uh, you know, maintenance of the range or have that go to person, go to company to be calling there. Absolutely. Okay. So I think uh, that kind of hand covers everything. Do you have any questions? Any questions come through? So we have a couple questions that are kind of more uh, general questions that we could go towards through there. Um, yeah, let's just get a couple there. of them. Yeah. In the spirit yeah. of, of of good podcasting. Yeah, we we can't leave anyone hanging. You know, Remember, the Celtics going to win tonight. I I I got a good energy coming. I, I, I got a good feeling about it. Game six right. in Boston. Yeah, feeling strong. All right, what do we got? So first question we'll have here is uh, from Logan. Um, are Mila ovens the best aesthetically if I'm going for a handleless kitchen? Hmm. There's a um, few options there. Yeah, that's, yeah. There's there's a lot of options for mm -hmm. handleless. Um, so I would tell you this: if you're going handleless and maybe in a, I'm digging in here, maybe a push to open. There, there's mm -hmm. these uh, refrigerators now that are push to open, so on and so forth. Know this: most brands are getting away from push to open. Yeah, it's not sticking around for long. In the big refrigerators, it wasn't received well, to be honest. And I know that it's super popular with cabinets. Um, but but dishwashers and refrigerators you're actually seeing you just saw i think it was thermidor fran just stopped with push to open right and they yeah. kind of were they're the one of the dominating refrigerators so just understand that um a lot of hinging is hard to really make yeah, work yeah you know what it is someone walks by and bumps it it opens on its own it, it would tell you to close it but i mean it's it got really kind of finicky and a lot of people realized while wow, cool initially in day-to-day -day practice it was really kind of frustrating getting back in there because Think about how many times you open it, close it. Oh, shoot, I need that again. And you know, it's, it starts to get clunky. Yeah. Um, but, you know, pocket handles and clean lines, I think meal is an option. Um, they don't have a handleless oven. Correct, friend? Correct me if I'm so wrong. So in their new style, yeah, they have the new style. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, to, TBD. If it's yeah. anything like the – if it's anything like the – I can tell you, dishwashers – and refrigerators have not been received well. They've been purchased, but the feedback has not been good to the point that manufacturers yeah. started stopping it. So, and for some of the wall ovens, you, know, you have yeah, Wolf, right Wolf had it out there for a while. Yeah, it, it really hasn't taken off. Yeah, we saw a lot of Wolf. I mean, it's yeah, kind exactly. of wolf. It's cool, but it's you know, we'll see. All right, next one's from David. So, again, you got to get a supply chain question in here. Is the supply situation any better for 18 inch European dishwashers? No, definitely not, David. The, the reality of it is, it's just not the American standard is 24 inches. So, 18 is, you know, they can't even fulfill 24 inches, and it takes the same amount of microchips to build a 24 inch as it does an 18 inch. And classically, 24 inch, I'm being honest, they can make more money. Uh, not a, not always. I mean, a European dishwasher could be it could be different, but they're they're going with the meat. I mean, we're having a hard enough time for a lot of brands getting 24 inch. I mean, nearly you can't even order dishwashers right now. Bosch just stopped taking all orders nationally for dishwashers for their 500 and 800 series. Um, so, you know, it's it's still all manufacturers still feeling that constraint. Um, Beko is a brand that would have them actually, and and honestly, it's. A, they just launched a new, and it's not just because we have them, guys. The, the dishwasher is really great, and they just launched some really cool technology. They won a ton of awards at KBiz, and um, that would be one brand to consider if someone has a Becco in your if you in your neighborhood. All right, I think we all have time for one more here, and we'll go to uh, Mary who asked, "Are Fisher Paykel gas ranges just as good as Blue Star?" Yeah, I'm a big fan of Fisher Paykel. Honestly, I think they've come a long way now. Understand, Fisher Pickle has a couple of steps here. So we just want to take off and talk apples to apples. They have a true pro range, um, which was built off the DCS platform. If you knew years and years ago, they bought, they took over the company DCS. They've taken it to a whole nother level. It's pretty much a whole new range now. But a true pro Fisher Pickle. And then they have kind of a European styled, softer styled, I'll call it pro pro. I mean, it's not fake quality, it's good quality. But it's more uh, European design. The interior ovens, it's nice and shallow. It flushes up well, but they're small. Uh, similar to brands like Bertazzoni, there's other brands out there. But a true probe, Fisher Paco, I think it's absolutely in the wheelhouse of a Blue Star on an all gas level. Blue Star, again, though, they have burners just by nature. Are, they are unique, more of a volcano burner, kind of a, a true. They're really going after that foodie chef kind of. That really kept a lot of its commercial lines. So 
Both really good options, but I think Fisher Pickles as good. Yes. Definitely. And then uh, we'll get one more here from Nate, not to leave him hanging. We did answer this before, so we can answer this quickly. How you? I know you love this question. How useful is the smaller oven on a 48? Thinking about jumping from a 36. Do not do it, Nate. Nathaniel, I can't allow it. I refuse. <laughs> I don't remember the do minute. Do it. It. I'm going to tell you, challenge this. Take the 36 inch that you were thinking of. Price it out. So take the same stove. A 36 inch unit, six burner. Price it out. Then take a 48 inch stove, same brand, same stove, same power, everything. Mm -hmm. Bunch of things are going to happen. You're more often than not, unless you're picking a wolf or a DC uh, fish pickle, maybe you have to do a grill or a griddle. So I'm going to tell you the jump from a 36 inch range to a 48 inch range at a minimum is $4,000, three to $4,000 jump. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's probably a lot more, honestly, but it's probably a minimum. Depending on the style. For and that amount of money, Nate. That 48 inch oven is tiny. You're going to have to send me the recipe of what you're going to cook in that baby. Aside from rolls, we talked about rolls. You could get me at rolls. I like carbs, potatoes. <laughs> I mean, really tiny, tiny things. Um, you could take that extra four grand that I think you're going to spend on a running average minimally to go from 36 to 48. And you could buy a whole nother 30 inch oven. And it's electric. It has all the features, bells, whistles, everything on it. And then you could save money if you really want to be savvy to a 36 inch all gas pro range. So now you have a gas oven, great for roasting and broiling, and you have a wall oven consumption that's up high, easy to get in and out of that's electric. So you could bake amazingly in the upper oven or maybe day in, day out. You use that because it's just easier on your body and more convenient. Know this, those 48 inch ovens, think about it when you do this. When people put those in a kitchen, your kitchen is under stress when you entertain. And when you entertain, everything in a 48-inch oven is in the oven. So everything, you put all the congestion at the stove. So you need to get your ovens. You're going to back up. You're going to pull down the draw. Oh, i got to get something up top. And, you know, you just created a quagmire. And a lot of times you put that also behind an island. So this gets really tight. So the idea of putting, um, uh, you know, a wall oven somewhere, and, and, and this, this is running long, but the last thing I'd say is, there's also another option that maybe we say for another thing is break it all up and do a 40. If you really want 48, Nate, if you want the top, if you want 48 inches for the top, then you can do what's called a range top. That's 48 inches. Imagine that 48 inch range and we chop the top off and you set it into your counter. And now you do two wall ovens somewhere else in the house. You'll save a ton of money. I want a Christmas card, Nate, if, if this works out the way I think it could for you. There we go. So we know how passionate Dennis is about that question. So we had to throw it out there. Oh, yeah. it drives me nuts every time. I'm like, no, do not do it. <laughs> Either go 60 inches and tell me you went for it all or do 36 and tell me you did a wall of it. I'm going to tell you, awesome, man, we really thought about it. Or do a range top and double ovens and holy smokes, now you're cooking with fire legitimately it's pretty awesome <laughs> yeah there we go <laughs> all right that's great so i think uh, i hope you all enjoyed the new kind of layout that we have for this episode here again we're trying to dive deep into certain categories here we started with pro ranges today um so we'll kind of keep with this format off and on a bit here too and kind of try to do some different things here on a week-to-week -week basis and uh hopefully keep all you guys interested yeah and i will say this if there's over, we think we know some of the categories but we don't know we want to know what you're mm -hmm. thinking so if you have overarching categories that you are having a hard time getting educated on or want deeper dives on, tee them up for us. Maybe that's the question. And on next week's segment or a segment coming up, we'll post that that's, you know, that's the segment we're going to, we're going to run and we'll try to get your questions answered. Absolutely. Cool. Thanks again, Dennis. Appreciate all the uh, input. Hey, you're not going to, you're gonna, not going to finish with the go Celtics. What's your prediction? Celtics. What's, you, what's, you the final? Me off. what's the over under? What, what's, what's the point differential? What are we winning for? Are we win it by 10 and we win it by five. What do you think? I'm gonna go eight point win. Some free, some free throws at the end to kind of distance it a little bit. Points. This is a blowout. This is a blowout. All right. Blowout. And, and, Lock on wood. <laughs> yeah. And 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 the last thing I'll just say, I've never seen anyone chew a mouthpiece more. He's amazing. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. That's hopefully, it. Well. hopefully he's a little bit more frustrated tonight. So we'll see. Yeah, we, we need him. We need him off his game. Yeah, for sure. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next week. See you next week. Take care, Fred. Bye-bye.